Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the fourth session of the Green Horizon Summit, exploring the framework for financing a whole economy. Private finance will fund the initiatives and innovation needed to get to net zero. Our job for COP26 is to ensure it has the necessary information, tools, and markets to enable this investment. That's why our objective for COP26 is to build the framework so that every private financial decision takes climate change into account. To explain more on this, we have with us today Antonio Guterres, UN Secretary General, and Mark Carney, the UN Special Envoy for Climate Change. We will then hear from the reporting panel, chaired by Francine Lacroix from Bloomberg, with a message from Minister Shaw in New Zealand. I very much look forward to hearing the discussion. Without further ado, let me hand over to the Secretary General. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to join you for this important meeting. Over the next 30 years, global greenhouse gas emissions must fall sharply and permanently to net zero. Otherwise, we'll not be able to limit temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius. The science is clear. Failure to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement means irreparable catastrophe for people, communities, economies and nations. Recently, we have heard encouraging announcements. The European Union, the United Kingdom, Japan and the Republic of Korea, together with more than 110 other countries, have pledged carbon neutrality by 2050. China has announced it will do so before 2060. That means 50% of the world's GDP and half of global CO2 emissions are now covered by a net zero commitment. These announcements sent unmistakable market signals to investors ready to fund a faster global transition to a renewable energy. They will also spur a faster decline in investments in coal and other fossil fuels. As my special envoy for climate finance, Mark Carney, has stressed, decarbonization is the greatest commercial opportunity of our time. Markets are moving, they are moving fast, and those who move first will benefit the most. But to make this transition permanent and transformative, everyone will need to play their part. So today I have a message for each of you. First, governments. You need to align the long-term objective of net zero emissions with your short-term COVID-19 recovery plans and your nationally determined contributions under the Paris Agreement. And to get to net zero by 2050, CO2 emissions must drop by 45% by 2030 compared with 2010 levels. Your action will provide the framework the private sector needs to invest in a net zero future, namely putting a price on carbon, ending subsidies for fossil fuels, and making climate-related financial disclosure mandatory. Second, development finance institutions, multilateral development banks, and climate funds. We need you to significantly scale up your role in improving the risk-return profiles of investments and to align your portfolios and pipelines with net zero goals. This will help to attract private capital for mitigation and adaptation, including in the developing world. Third, asset owners and managers. We need you to act urgently to shift the trillions of dollars you invest towards the sustainable economy. Price in and disclose climate risks, and only pursue investments that have accounted for these risks. Ensure all your portfolios align with net zero goals. Join a multi-stakeholder initiative, such as the UN convened Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance, that is taking concrete measures to promote portfolio-wide net zero alignment. And use your voting powers in companies to accelerate their decarbonization by systematically supporting climate resolutions in shareholder meetings. Fourth, and finally, I have a message for financial authorities and regulators. You need to embed net zero measures in fiscal and economic policies, public bank mandates and procurement standards. Support net zero through incentives and regulation to level the playing field. In closing, let me emphasize that everyone has a crucial role. 
all governments, cities, financial institutions, and private businesses must establish their transition plans for net zero emissions by 2050 and start with concrete policies now. Together, we can achieve carbon neutrality for a sustainable future. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary General, and thank you for your message and thank you for your leadership. I know you take an intense personal interest in this agenda, the private finance agenda. I have a series of texts and late night phone calls uh, that attest to that. And I'm pleased to say that we are making progress. More needs to be done. Um, earlier, we were speaking about uh, the thousands and thousands of organizations in the private sector, in the public sector, uh, the NGO sector, the third sector that are working as part of this agenda. And we're, we're very privileged to have uh, some representatives of that work here with us to go through each of the main pillars of what's needed for the framework to make sure that every financial decision can take climate change into account. With respect to reporting, um, the goal for COP 26 is to improve both the quantity and really the quality of climate-related financial risk disclosure and to promote pathways to mandatory uh, TCFD reporting, um, make sure that it's comprehensive con and consistent. And the first panel will delve into what that means in practice. We'll start, as the Lord Mayor said, with a message from Minister Shaw from New Zealand who helped guide New Zealand to become the first country to make the TCFD mandatory. Our panelists are Mary Shapiro, uh, who's led the TCFD since its inception five years ago, Lucretia Reichlin, uh, who has many roles, but very importantly um, is heading up the work for the IFRS Foundation uh, as they look at a whole new area of reporting, sustainability reporting, and Audrey Choi from Morgan Stanley, who will discuss their perspectives on why climate-related reporting is so crucial um, and what we need to do in designing and implementing those disclosure regimes. Um, and I, we all look forward to hearing uh, their perspectives as we move forward onto this. The second session will focus on risk management. Again, our goal for COP26 is to ensure that both companies and financial firms can effectively measure and manage climate-related financial risks. Um, and that means going beyond the static, in other words, uh, car cl climate footprints or carbon footprints today, to the strategic, how they're going to be managed uh, over time as we move towards net zero. Um, it requires forward-looking disclosure, and it requires judgment, judgment about the resilience of companies and of financial firms and the resilience of their strategies during the transition. Um, and let's be frank, this is a new area. It's an area where we all need to develop skills in both the private and public sectors. And I can think of no one better to lead that discussion or provide that perspective than Sarah Breeden, uh, the Executive Director at the Bank of England, um, who will describe the work of the NGFS, which she has helped lead. Uh, in terms of publishing scenarios for transitions, but also providing supervisory perspectives and supervisory guidance to firms in the financial sector. Finally, on returns, uh, we will be joined by David Blood, who's co-founder of Generation Investment Management um, and who has led a task force uh, as part of the broader TCFD efforts uh, entitled uh, Measuring Portfolio Alignment. It is uh, published today. It's in the Knowledge Resources section of the TCFD website. I would encourage you to uh, go through it. And it gets to the crucial question of how investors can assess their position on this transition. So both as a uh, risk management and return optimization tool for investors, but very importantly as well for clients, for all of you, um, so that you can make decisions, so that you can make your money matter. Um, and I will have an opportunity to uh, discuss that uh, with David in a while. Um, enough from me. Let's hear directly from the true experts. Uh, in order to start s this session uh, and to build on the uh, building blocks, um, we're going to have a panel on the TCFD, chaired by Francine Lacqua from Bloomberg. Uh, but first, we will begin with a message from New Zealand, uh, and I give you Minister James Shaw.
Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you very much to the Green Horizon Summit for the opportunity to share with you the steps that our government is taking to address climate risk in the financial sector. A few weeks ago, I was delighted to announce that Aotearoa New Zealand will put climate change at the heart of financial decision making by becoming the first country in the world to introduce a mandatory climate related disclosures regime across the financial system. The idea is simple to make sure that large organisations understand how climate change will impact their business in the future. Crucially, when businesses have this information, they can change. They can adopt low carbon strategies that will not only be good for business, but help cut emissions. Over the last three years, Aotearoa New Zealand has put in place an ambitious legal and institutional framework to tackle climate change. An essential part of this is the Zero Carbon Bill, which was passed by Parliament unanimously last year and sets a legally binding commitment to keep Aotearoa New Zealand within the globally agreed limit of 1.5 degrees Celsius of global warming. As you all know, this is a huge task and the window of opportunity is closing. But it is possible if we choose to act now not after we have dealt with the economic crisis brought about by the pandemic, but right now. Bringing climate risks and resilience into the heart of financial decision making will help to accelerate those emissions reductions and the transition to a low carbon economy. Our new reporting regime for climate risk will apply to publicly listed companies and large insurers, bank and investment managers, on a comply or explain basis. In total, around 200 organisations, equivalent to approximately 90% of financial assets under management in New Zealand, will have to make annual disclosures, covering governance arrangements, risk management, and strategies for mitigating any climate change impacts. If they are unable to disclose, they must explain why. Disclosures will have to comply with one of the reporting standards that New Zealand's external reporting board is starting to develop. These standards will be based on the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures Framework. An independent monitoring, reporting and enforcement regime will also be introduced as the responsibility of the Financial Markets Authority. As we transition to a low carbon economy, the introduction of new policies, changes in technology and the growing risks from more extreme weather, droughts or flooding will impact on the value of financial assets. These changes that we are introducing will mean that companies can provide clear, comprehensive and complete reports on these risks and the impact that they will have on their business. While New Zealand is taking this step, I want to acknowledge that we are not alone. There are now over 110 regulators and governmental entities from around the world supporting the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures. We are also watching with interest the UK's consultations on requiring mandatory disclosure from premium listed issuers and large pension schemes closely and hope to work together as this develops in our respective countries. In recent years, our government has put in place policies and legislation that will bend the curve of New Zealand's emissions downwards. Requiring large organisations to report on climate risk is very much a part of this. It's another step on the journey that Aotearoa New Zealand is taking towards a low carbon future and a clearer, safer planet for future generations. It's hard to overstate how important this is. Organisations that think ahead and align their business models to the transition to a net zero world now will be amongst the most successful in the future. However, those businesses that do not, those that delay action, will be the ones to face the greatest disruption. And the longer that action to cut emissions is delayed, the more the risk grows. This really is the choice that companies face. 
When I travel around Aotearoa talking to businesses about climate change, I often tell the story of the chief executive who said to me during the passage of our government's zero carbon bill that his young daughter had told him one evening that she no longer wanted to have children because of the climate crisis. What do I say to her? He asked me. Well, because of the changes that we are making, I'm pleased that I can now say to him that there will be businesses up and down the country who will soon understand exactly how they can play their part in making this world cleaner and safer. A world I am sure he is hoping will one day be home to his grandchildren. No reira tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tato katoa. Well, good afternoon and good morning, everyone. And thank you, of course, to Minister Shaw. As we were just hearing, achieving a net zero economy really requires a whole economy to transition. I'm delighted uh, to welcome my panel. I know Mark Carney has already done so, but this is a panel on reporting the future of climate related financial disclosures, as we heard uh, Mr. Carney say. Now, if I were in person or if we were all in person in the same room, I'd ask you to give a big round of applause uh, to my panelists, but you can do so now from the comfort of your own home. Mary Shapiro, Vice Chair of Global Public Policy and Special Advisor to the Founder and Chairman of Bloomberg. Lucrezia Reichling, Professor of Economics at London Business School, but also Trustee IFRS. And Audrey Troy, the Chief Sustainability Officer at Morgan Stanley. So thank you uh, all for joining us. Mary, let's did all, you know, start off with you. What is the future of climate change reporting and are we moving in the right direction? Sure, thank you. And I want to congratulate Minister Shaw for the incredible steps that New Zealand has taken, and I hope you will be a model for the rest of the world. Um, so maybe the best way for me to talk about this is, is to just give you a little bit of an overview of the TCFD status report, the third status report that was just issued after presentation to the Financial Stability Board last month. And, and what, we, what we saw with this status report is that we've seen really substantial progress in mainstreaming TCFD disclosure requirements. Um, and those have, that's really been driven by investor demand, such as BlackRock or uh, Legal and General Investment Management, GPIF, Climate Action 100 Plus, um, so many large institutional investors really pushing for this kind of uh, information to help inform their capital allocation decisions. We've seen it also driven by the policy and regulatory actions of central banks. The minister just mentioned more than 100 regulators around the world have endorsed climate reporting or the TCFD specifically. We've seen it with national governments. We have eight national governments that have um, endorsed TCFD reporting. We also see it with um, being driven by green recovery programs in countries like Canada, where participation in the large employer uh, pandemic recovery program required a commitment to report on climate related risk by those companies. And then, of course, we see it, and, and I know Audrey will speak to this, um, being driven by good business practices. Companies with more than $12 trillion in market capitalization support the TCFD and have begun reporting using the TCFD framework. 42% um, of companies with a market cap over $10 billion disclose at least some information in line with TCFD. And as Mark Carney said earlier this morning, energy companies lead, uh, buildings and materials follow, and, and then um, we've also seen that European companies have the highest percentage of TCFD aligned disclosure. So we're making a lot of progress. We do see companies struggle with translating climate impacts um, on the business strategy into financial terms. And we see them struggle a bit with the conduct of scenario analysis, which is one of the key recommendations of the TCFD. So we've tried to respond to that by providing guidance. And for example, with respect to scenario analysis, we've published practical process-oriented guidance for non-financial companies on how to organize themselves internally to conduct scenario analysis and how to disclose those results. We've also published guidance on how to integrate 
climate risk into broader risk management processes and a consultation as well on the usefulness and the challenges of forward-looking metrics such as implied temperature rise or climate VAR. Um, the report um, also I think is very helpful in that it, it discusses what experts view as the most useful disclosures for them to make um, investment decisions. Um, climate impacts on business and strategy and information by sector and geography are, um, are the most useful according to um, our survey. And the report also provides lots of examples of effective disclosures and even a number of case studies. But as I said, despite steady progress, we, we need more to be done to ensure, um, as Governor Carney would say, that every financial decision considers the risks of climate change. Um, and that's why I think so many jurisdictions are now on a path to mandatory adoption of climate risk disclosure, hopefully using the TCFD framework as the foundation. Um, we've, we've pushed for voluntary disclosure, that was our remit from the Financial Stability Board, um, but to, I think, to get um, a compelling number of companies actually disclosing uh, mandatory um, approaches um, are increasingly necessary. The Financial Stability Board has asked us to con continue our work for another year, and we'll focus on deep deepening implementation given the global coalescence around the TCFD as the framework. Um, we want to understand the gaps in asset owner and asset manager disclosure, and we will work with standard setters such as IFRS and regulators on filling out the TCFD framework with standards so we can avoid um, fragmentation and divergence in approaches to creating standards. So a lot of progress, a lot more to do. I think we're in a pretty good place. And um, I know we'll maybe perhaps talk about the U.S. election later. I think that that um, is only a positive for the future financial reporting on climate risk. Yeah, well, we certainly will, Mary. Thank you so much. We'll talk about what a Biden administration means for financial reporting. But um, Lucrezia, can you take stock in, in you know, the report or the progress we've done so far? Is it despite COVID or is almost thanks to COVID that, that companies want to do more, disclose more? Well, I think that, uh, you know, the direction of travel has been a good one. And in fact, it's a pleasure to talk after Mary, who has been really led the work on, uh, you know, building uh, uh, a credible green reporting infrastructure. I mean, to, to lay the foundation through the work at the TCFD and also her role at SASB. So we have seen, uh, you know, more and more work in this area. And this is a very difficult area, both at the conceptual level, because, you know, Mary has talked about stress testing. You know, this is something that, uh, you know, these are tools that are uh, used in risk management or, uh, you know, for banks, uh, you know, prudential tools, but, uh, you know, for reporting, this is quite an innovation. And if you ask an accountant who is used to do financial reporting, you know, this is a completely new world. So it's challenging from a conceptual point of view. It's challenging because, uh, you know, different companies, different countries want to do different things. And so we need an harmonization. We have had a lot of players uh, recommending different things. So now it is important to go contrary disclosure, in my view, to a framework uh, which uh, would allow mandatory standards and it will be sufficiently harmonized so that to become global. Now, has COVID helped? Well, maybe this was a, a shock that made us, you know, scare everybody of, uh, you know, because uh, it, it is conceivable that, uh, you know, virus pandemics are related to changes in climate and uh, we have to take this very seriously. And, uh, you know, so reporting is one component of that, together with public policies and, of course, uh, other tools that uh, are there. Um, Audrey, your initial thoughts. Thank you, Lucrezia. Your initial thoughts and actually what could be done for this financial reporting and disclosure to, to really accelerate in terms of the trend that we've seen so far. Yeah, thanks so much, Francine. Um, you know, as always, it's a, it is a great to follow Mary, as Lucretia said, because, and really, I think we just need to follow Mary's lead because what we really need for more progress in this space is, um, frankly, is just to have more facts and to have more data, right? We all know, you know, um, 
if we're so lucky that we get to the state, which I think we basically are at, that people understand the realities of climate change and how material that is to business risk, right? Then you can only, then you know that you have to manage to it and you can't manage to something if you don't have measurements and metrics. And so, um, you know, for example, the, the, the work of the, um, the PCAF, Partnership for Carbon Accounting Financials, where we were extremely um, uh, honored to be able to be the first U.S. institution to join the steering committee of PCAF and the working group there, you know, I think that work is very foundational to be able to say, we have to come um, to a commonly agreed upon, widely accepted, business useful way of talking about carbon emissions. So then we can all be reporting on it. And then we, people can really make decision useful comparisons of how is company A doing versus company B. And if you are an investor who is concerned about climate change and, and really concerned about managing your own climate risk, how are you going to think about these two different players? Um, and so I, I, I am actually very optimistic on this because I believe that um, you know, the, the, uh, the recognition is extraordinarily widespread that this is no longer an optional Right. What, I mean, frankly, what Mary and Governor Carney have been saying for years is that this is material to business. This is a potential threat to financial stability. Um, and that this has to be something that any prudent risk manager, whether or not they have or care in air quotes about the environment, any prudent risk manager, any corporate leader, um, you know, and certainly any investor needs to think very seriously about this. You know, I also have the enormous honor of uh, serving with Mary on the board of the SASB. And to give you just one data point, right, the SASB found that something, something like only 93% of the U.S. equity markets are exposed to climate risk in a way that is not currently really priced in. Right. And if you if that's not, you know, just one data point that should make every investor think, what am I not understanding about the full picture of risk and of opportunity if I look at financials that don't have climate risk? So I think we're going to we are already seeing the incredible acceleration of market and investor momentum to, and uh, and the whole risk establishment across uh, industry and finance and regarding climate risk is probably one of the single most important things we need to look about end to end right now. I mean, that's uh, thank you, Audrey. It's a pretty impressive figure, ninety-three percent. Uh, Mary, let's maybe address you know the, the Biden administration and and what kind of difference you think the Biden administration will do in terms of financial disclosure and reporting. Well, I I think the differences will be extraordinary, obviously, um, and the uh, president-elect has really set out a very aggressive science-based climate policy, um, including a commitment to net zero for the United States by 2050, and, um, and a series of executive orders to really drive progress across every sector of our economy, as well as a very robust legislative agenda. Whether or not a robust legislative agenda can make it through um, a divided uh, Congress is, is, of course, not clear. One would hope that um, members of Congress will rally around this issue, just as Audrey has said, and recognize it as a material risk to financial stability uh, and to, to our economy more broadly and be able to support a legislative program. But even if they don't, um, there's so much that can be done and will be done under a Biden administration. I think we'll have, you know, Mark Carney talks about a whole economy transition. I think we'll have a whole economy, a whole government uh, transition or a whole government strategy around climate change that will really call on every agency and department to account for the impacts of climate change in all of their actions. Some of this will help to reverse the damage that has been done over the last four years, but some of it will surely break very new territory for us. And, and I think it's really important for people to remember how much can be done without um, Congress having to pass laws. So for example, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the agency I used to chair, can write rules that require consistent and rigorous disclosure of climate risk by public companies. Um, the banking agencies can consider climate risk in their micro and macro prudential supervision, um, which would um, following in the footsteps of the NGFS and the Bank of England and a number of other really leading central banks. The Department of Labor can reverse rules that uh, it recently passed that prohibit or discourage at best climate considerations in pension fund investing or by pension funds voting proxies. And, 
and just government procurement um, can be a huge lever here. If the government spends billions of dollars every year, it can do so in a, in a more sustainable way. So I think there's a lot that can be done. And in fact, the CFTC put out a report a couple of months ago um, that outlines, really creates a roadmap for financial regulators of all the ways in which they can weigh into the climate debate and have a very positive impact. Um, President-elect Biden has made it clear we'll rejoin Paris and that he will work very aggressively on the energy transition. He's put up a budget roughly of about $40 billion, $400 billion of investment in clean energy over 10 years, which also has the benefit of creating millions of jobs. You know, that's, maybe that's harder to get done, but as I said, there's so much that can be done by departments and agencies without legislation. I think we can catch up, and, and if the rest of the world will have us, we can lead again. And Mary, you're confident that all of this can be done without disclosure having to be mandatory? How important is mandatory? Oh, no, I think I think the SEC um, should and will move to mandatory disclosure. To Audrey's point earlier, if climate risk, if, if 93% of US market capitalization is exposed to climate risk in a material way, companies need to be disclosing that risk already. The, what the SEC can do is provide specificity and guidance and a mandate for that disclosure that will help ensure that it's comparable and therefore more valuable to investors who are trying to make choices about how to invest. Audrey, do you agree with that? Does it have to be mandatory for, for it to, you know, we've done so much already. Is the next step mandatory? Well, look, I would say, you know, I think that policy is incredibly important and that policy can certainly have an incredible effect to accelerate or decelerate trends. And so I think if it is mandatory, as, as Mary has suggested, that would certainly accelerate it. Um, but I think that, you know, what, what we're really already seeing is that, um, that investors are realizing that, you know, that they don't want to be ignorant of material risks to their portfolio. And I think that, you know, we are um, already seeing, you know, very dramatic momentum, right? Just to give you kind of a few other kind of, you know, highlights, um, you know, we see, you know, at Morgan Stanley, we actually started our commitment to sustainable finance actually 12 years ago in 2009, because we were convinced that the impacts on the environment and society, uh, whether that be health, like we're seeing with the COVID pandemic or on the labor force are all intertwined and really material to, to an investment and to an understanding of, of risk and return. And so we've already seen more than $12 trillion in the United States focusing on stem investing, $30 trillion globally. Um, and you know, when we do polls of investors for the last several years, we've consistently seen climate change as the top theme that, uh, that investors are interested in aligning with. I think the other thing that's important, though, is we've seen a real change in why and how investors want to focus on climate change through their investments. Right. I think, you know, if you go back to ancient history of maybe five or 10 years ago, there may have been more of a mission alignment focus on climate change. Um, but what you're seeing now is a really broadening of understanding about why this is material to both risk and return. Um, you know, and again, we, we recently, out of the Institute for Sustainable Investing, we recently did a study of sustainability-focused strategies, so strategies that really align investments with things like climate risk. And when you compare those to, to traditional strategies, uh, what's fascinating is, let's even just take, you know, 2019 and 2020. In 2019, in the sort of dramatic bull markets that you had globally, the sustainable strategies actually outperformed the traditional strategies. And then in 2020, with all of this extraordinarily volatility, you again, um, up through the end of September, we've seen the sustainability strategies um, outperform as well. They're actually in the black, whereas the traditional strategies, maybe not including the past few days, this is up through the end of September, we're actually in the red. Um, so we do think that we're actually seeing a tremendous alignment right now of the coming together of, um, of increased uh, investor interest in it, but also increased proof of performance from an investor perspective, um, you know, combined with, I think what's the most important thing about the reporting and the disclosure is increased data, right? And at the end of the day, if we can have a science-based, data-driven basis for information, that is going to be one of the most powerful forces to accelerate the movement of private sector capital. And to the extent that policy can be a supportive rather than a supportive factor, rather than a deterrent to that is going to be enormous. Um, Audrey, I'll ask you in a second how we avoid greenwashing in those types of scenarios. But Lucrezia, can, can you talk us first whether you think a common framework is enough 
or whether we need, need to go into you know, mandatory disclosure? Well, as I said at the beginning, I really believe that we should go from, uh, you know, from uh, voluntary disclosure to, to mandatory disclosure and to standards. And this is actually why the IFRS uh, has stepped in uh, and opened a consultation asking exactly to our stakeholders that question, does the world need global mandatory standards? And uh, the reason why we, we move towards uh, this consultation is because, uh, you know, the, the, the message that we got from stakeholders and from investors is that uh, there has been great work done, but uh, actually the landscape is relatively chaotic in the sense that there are, you know, different uh, recommendations and standards. There are up to 1,700 different metrics uh, now available for comp companies to, to consider. There is a danger of uh, greenwashing, as, uh, as, you, as you suggested. So we need to you know, move in the first step and somebody has to take responsibilities. Uh, now there is the work of the TCFD. There, are, there, there is important work by, done by the, the standard setters, sustainability standard setter organizations, the big five organizations, including standards. Uh, but we need to, you know, go, you know, kind of, and then actually not only that, but there is also work done by important jurisdiction. Now I'm thinking, for example, of the European Union, which uh, has started the very ambitious uh, program uh, on, uh, on taxonomy and, uh, and also is developing reporting standards uh, which are coherent uh, with the more ambitious uh, a uh, green agenda, which involves all kinds of out, after different policy tools. So then the question is, okay, if we want to go towards mandatory uh, standards, uh, if we want to go towards harmonization, then uh, what is the governance for that process? And that's actually uh, a difficult pro question to ask too, because uh, there are different legal frameworks, there are different policies, and, uh, you know, so we cannot uh, step in immediately into something that would uh, fit, them, fit every country and, and every company. So this will have to be a process. So the question that we are asking in our uh, consultation is how can we move towards global standards in a way that will provide the core of acceptable you know, global standards, uh, but it will not uh, contrast uh, the speed that certain jurisdictions want to have, maybe the ambitions, uh, high level of ambition that certain jurisdictions want to have. So the way in which this kind of global and regional process will play together and will interact is very important to design. And uh, I think it will be a requirement for success, okay, whatever whoever is going to end up being the consolidator and uh, you know maybe the frs would be in collaboration with the existing organizations maybe somebody else whoever will do it uh, uh, you know it's important that these regional global questions uh, will be you know properly defined mary and before we go to mary actually i'm getting some great questions so just keep on sending your questions in and we'll get to them in a second mary I just want to echo something Lucretia said because I think it's so important. Um, you know, in most of most countries in the world, certainly across the G20, material risks, including climate risk, already have to be disclosed by companies um, for their investors' benefit. What I think mandatory does, if is if it's globally coordinated, is allows us to avoid very different um, approaches in different jurisdictions with different standards that renders the disclosure less useful to investors because it's non-comparable. And that's where I think organizations like IFRS in particular become really important to helping us create something that's coherent and comparable, the most useful process. Um, if Com if companies already have to disclose because of materiality considerations, we, we ought to have them disclosing in roughly the same way using the TCFD as the foundation. Um, I have this good question coming in, and it's one to you, although, Mary, I think you addressed it right now. But the question is, how will we know what good disclosure looks like and who will make the decision of good or bad? Lucrezia, I don't know if you want to kick us off on that one. Well, um, okay, so here, this is uh, one of the questions so we are asking in our consultation is, um, should, uh, you know, the, should we have a standard setting uh, board for uh, climate related uh, disclosure? And should such board uh, be under the 
umbrella of the FRS. Okay, so there are some advantages uh, in that kind of governance uh, because our governance is a three-tier structure. So the, the regulators, the public policy authorities uh, uh, are in a monitoring board which oversees the work of uh, independent trustees, of which I am one of them. And we are independent individuals and ourselves, we oversee the, the, the work of the technical board, the ISB, which set the standards for financial accounting. So we are proposing such a structure also for climate uh, related standards that would be uh, uh, an independent board, a second board under our umbrella. The advantage will be to have the input uh, of the regulators, but at the same time to have the input uh, of the private sector. So if you want, it's a hybrid structure, which is not totally public and is not totally private. So it's kind of joined the, you know, the different uh, you know, stakeholders. And, uh, you know, and we'll ha also have the advantage uh, of, uh, uh, so we'll be independent uh, and we'll be connected uh, to the boards that set the standard for financial accounts, which of course is something that uh, uh, it's important because, uh, you know, climate risk are material also for financial accounts. So this is, uh, uh, is a structure which has advantages and will have, uh, you know, the legitimacy, you know, to decide what is good and what is bad. Uh, because there will be the oversight and so on. And, uh, but, you know, to get to such construction, that would be a new piece of the financial architecture. Of course, this, uh, you know, requires uh, wide uh, consultations, and this is what we are doing now. Um, Audrey, I wanted to go back to, to greenwashing. What's the one step that you would put in place to avoid uh, greenwashing without, you know, um, going into mandatory disclosure? Um, well, look, I think that, um, you know, it, it, it really does go back to just the um, the baseline of, of, you know, what has been sort of the, the word, magic word of this session, which is around materiality, right? Um, I think that uh, we, we see how material climate change um, and sustainability measures are to performance. And um, as we are able to get more and more data around what are the factors that you measure to really tell how you can compare company A to company B, you know, within their sector and really who is, you know, reverting, you know, who is at the mean, who is above the mean, who's below the mean, that's how you start to get away from greenwashing, right? Green, I mean, talking about your companies or your investment portfolios, sustainability cannot be an interpretive dance, right? It has to actually be something that is based on science, based on data, and just as with every other thing that a company would disclose or that, a, you know, an investment manager would disclose, it's also about benchmarks. And so we have to get to the point where we have, um, you know, exactly as Miriam Kush has been saying, globally accepted parameters for industry by industry. What are the factors, environmental, social, and governance that are material? Where do companies rate on that? And then where does your company rate relative to, to, that, to that benchmark? And so until we can get that data, you know, it, it, it does become a bit more of a, you know, of a, of a hand-waving exercise. And that's not what markets and what investors need or want. So I do think that, you know, it's really is build, you know, putting together all these building blocks of, you know, of the FSB having said, you know, having established TCFD to say climate change is actually a financial risk issue. And then layering on top the incredible work of a SASB or an IFRS, or, you know, um, and the PRA and, uh, and uh, really the NGFS, I think is one of the you know, most amazing developments to see how extraordinarily quickly the NGFS has grown, where it now has, I believe, 75 members and another 13 observers. So you really do have you know, the, the vast majority of the regulatory structure of the world saying from an oversight perspective, you cannot ignore climate change. It's just fiscally irresponsible um, and material to investors. And so I think that the more we just have, you know, more and more um, acknowledgement of that, and frankly, the investors, I think, are already there, um, it, it, it becomes, you know, much, uh, much more difficult uh, to be able to greenwash and much more comforting that you really can actually compare sort of apples to apples. Uh, Mary, do you want to go back to the question, which is who will make the decision on good and bad disclosures? Sure, I do. And I, I but I want to agree with Audrey. I think um, the the solution to greenwashing is, is really transparency. And it's about good data, full disclosure, and some consistency of definitions or taxonomy um, when we're defining what, what is green and what isn't. But I think investors will tell us what is good disclosure and what is good enough disclosure. Um, and, and 
they haven't been shy in telling us, at least at the TCFD, what it is they need in order to um, have the best informed uh, capital allocation decisions. And I think when the disclosure becomes a component, as Mark Carney would say, of every financial decision made by an investment professional, then we'll know we've gotten it right and, and we've put the right elements of disclosure on the table. Mary, I have another question, which maybe you can uh, get us started with, which is how do we avoid a disclosure, disclosure overload and the risk of companies paying undue focus on what their disclosure is over actually becoming greener and cleaner? So it's interesting. One of the things we've heard from companies consistently is that as they've started the process of developing their disclosure under TCFD, they've learned a lot about their business's resiliency to climate risk, and they've learned a lot about opportunities that they hadn't really thought through before. So we actually see a side benefit of the disclosure, which benefits, of course, investors and stakeholders generally, insurers and lenders, but the internal look has really benefited companies in how they run their business and how they think about the future and how they plan for resiliency. So um, I think, um, look, we we hear all the time as a, as a lifelong regulator of securities markets and disclosure systems, I've heard forever that there's disclosure overload and there's too much and nobody pays attention to it and it's boilerplate and it's not meaningful. And, and some of that is certainly true, uh, but this is an area where particularly using the TCFD framework, you can have a discussion with your investors and with your audience about your governance, about risk management, about the business strategies, resilience to climate change without it being overloaded. It just is not a given that because there's new information to disclose that somehow it will be overdone or we'll get immaterial information clogging up disclosure documents. So I think um, the beauty of this TCFD framework really is it's principle based and it leaves it to the company to decide how to make the disclosure um, hopefully with, gov uh, with guidance and maybe even mandates from their national governments. But it, I, I, I guess I don't really buy the disclosure overload concern. I think these are me real material risks. Companies have to disclose them. Um, thank you, Mary. Lucrezia, this one is for, this, this question is for you. How is IFRS aligning with the work being done by the EU? Well, um, we, are, we are very uh, much, uh, you know, in touch with the EU and we are following with uh, great interest their work and we are actually uh, also giving uh, an input uh, to the working uh, group of the IFRAG, uh, um, which, you know, have asked us, uh, they have asked us to comment on, uh, on the connectivity with financial reporting, with uh, non-financial non financial reporting. Um, the EU, uh, in our view, will have to be, you know, an input uh, uh, to this kind of global effort. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, when I think of the sustain sustainability board that I described earlier, of course, I think uh, as the EU as one component of the monitoring board in, in such framework. And, uh, you know, given the fact that the EU has been uh, kind of uh, very ambitious, uh, you know, to in, the, in, this, in this agenda, I think that their input will be very valuable. But as I said earlier, um, you know, the EU may want to be even more ambitious than, uh, you know, what we can aspire as a global standard setters. And this is why it's very important uh, to have a framework which uh, would be nested. So to have a core of global standards, which would be nested uh, in, uh, uh, you know, in, uh, in other standards, uh, possibly more ambitious and also broader in terms of scope, people talk not only the EU talks, for example, not only uh, in terms of climate, but also other aspects of sustainability. So these synergies, I think this is a dynamic process in which uh, we start with the core and then, uh, you know, we, we learn from, uh, you know, a different from jurisdictions which do things at different level of ambitious. This heterogeneity is in inevitable because the legal frameworks and the public policies are different uh, across jurisdictions. So I think that uh, this is why we require this flexibility. It's very important. It's, it's a key element, uh, I think, on, the, on this. Um, Audrey, how do you think, I mean, do, do you think there's a, a danger that we overburden certain companies? And I'm thinking maybe specifically of small and medium-sized companies that some size say, you know, this is an expensive kind of process. Um, you know, 
I see. I think one of the things. Uh, so look, I mean, to Mary's point, right? Uh, regulations and disclosures always are uh, require a bit of work, and that is sort of part of you know the the um, that's a little bit of the cost of doing business. I think you know one of the things that I would focus on is um, that I, I think really, as, as Mary said, what what corporate leaders, including small businesses, find is that when they look more closely at sustainability issues, they actually see that this is not just about um, sort of, a, a, you know, I, I feel like we've been talking about this very much like um, eating your least favorite vegetable. You know, I happen to actually love spinach, but, uh, you know, it's often talked about as oh, sustainability and disclosures and all these acronyms. And certainly that's going to mean less business. Right. And I think that the, the part that we overlook too often is the fact about the opportunity. And what you've seen when, when we've worked with, you know, corporations, both large and small, you know, whether it's entrepreneurial or, you know, or really some of the largest corporations in the world, even if they initially uh, approach sustainability as a cost of doing business or an, a burden or, you know, some, some kind of um, duty, when they actually engage, you know, in a, in a real way with the topic, they find that it can actually lead them ultimately to cost savings, right? So if you're thinking about more about recycling and more about efficient use of energy and efficient use of water, you can actually, you know, reduce your cogs, right? If you actually start thinking more, you know, holistically about your, your social compact with your workers and your community, you can actually start seeing lower potential liabilities or regulations or other things. But I think most importantly, you start seeing innovation. Right. And we've actually seen tremendous opportunities for outsized growth when you have uh, innovation that is based on, you know, something really not radical at all, which is what are the biggest mega trends informing the future cost and availability of natural resources? Right. So most businesses are built today on assuming the low, I mean, the free or near free costs of clean water, clean air, disposing of, you know, dirty water or dirty air. And once you realize that that may not always be the case and you look to not just avoid or minimize the impact of the regulation on your business, but you actually say, what is the opportunity there? You actually start having tremendous amounts of new product creations. And so I really think that you know, frankly, for all of us, as uh, you know, in the sustainability community, we need to kind of be uh, constantly reminding people about both sides of those things. And again, I think what has been very encouraging and why we're seeing so much momentum from capital markets and from corporate leaders is we actually have seen reduced volatility for those companies who do a good job of managing themselves from a sustainability perspective, as well as increased um, upside. And I really have, you know, I don't think I've ever met a trader or an investor who doesn't want alpha generation and beta reduction at the same time. Um, I have a great question actually for, I think let's maybe start with either Mary or Lucrezia saying, given the need for a whole economy transition, how do we ensure financial firms are disclosing their approach to stewardship and impact on system-wide transition, as well as financial risks. Lucrezia, do you want to kick it off? Well, I mean, uh, that's a matter of what uh, kind of standards uh, you're going to design, right? So I think that, uh, you know, maybe Mary, with the experience of the TCFD, uh, you, you have to, you had addressed this, these issues. But uh, if I understand well the the question, I mean, is uh, I mean the the question is uh, also the. Um, I the, think it's the more holistic. To the transition risk. Yeah, I think it's more holistic approach to basically yeah. how do you you know do a white you know a more system wide transition without only focusing on climate change. Oh, okay. Sorry, I mis misunderstood the question. So, uh, beyond climate, we know that there are other aspects of sustainability, um, and uh, for example, uh, labor relationships, uh, governance, and so on. So, the three aspects of the ESG. Uh, we think actually that these aspects are related. I mean, if you ask me personally, I think that these aspects are related. Uh, there is maybe a, a higher level of urgency when we are talking about climate change. Uh, so I think that from a, a you know pragmatic perspective, uh, if I think of uh, you know a possible you know new global standard setter board, uh, it would be uh, you know uh, it would be maybe uh, better to start with, uh, with with climate, which is the most urgent thing. But uh, you know, being open to uh, to other aspects of sustainability. I mentioned before, the EU is going towards uh, that kind of idea. Okay, to to have broader, uh, to have a broader scope. 
There are other issues, uh, which is, uh, uh, are we going to look at uh, standards uh, uh, in relationship to risk uh, uh, for companies? So, you know, with an investment focus, or we sh should we need standards uh, which also are going to look at the material impact of what companies do on the environment? Okay, so this is another aspect of how broad the scope of this future standard setter body should be. Uh, again, here, I think that uh, uh, it would be better to start from the TCFD philosophy, which, uh, you know, looks at the impact on the company as a first step. In my view, it will be difficult to clearly separate the two, to separate the two aspects so that maybe we should think again in a dynamic way that, uh, uh, you know, there is a little bit there also learning in this process. Uh, we know from the financial crisis uh, that, uh, you know, you can focus in a company, but then everything is related and then what looks like micro becomes macro so that uh, is not uh, obvious how to separate these different aspects. And I think we probably with this kind of risk uh, would be the same. But uh, as I said, our, our view as I mean, at least of the FRS trustees are proposing in the consultation to start from a narrow focus, but keeping an eye to further development. Um, thank you so much. We're almost running out of time, but this is too important not to ask. What is the one thing, Mary, that needs to be done in the next six months to make sure we move forward on this? Uh, I think it's, it's really critically important that companies get started on this journey of disclosure. And, um, and it's, you know, the framework is scalable. It's possible to start in a very uh, qualitative discussion-like way and talk about governance and risk management and strategy, and then gain expertise and capacity to become more quantitative and more sophisticated in analysis. But until the disclosure is out there and available to investors and lenders and insurers, we're not going to have uh, future-proofed, in a sense, the financial system from climate change. And, and so companies just need to get started. Lucrezia, in, in 20 seconds, the, the priority for the next six months? I think that companies have given us the message, now is the moment of the global regulators to say, Let, let's go for it. Audrey? Um, you know, I, I, I would just echo uh, uh, that all companies need to just focus on the fact that uh, this, is, this is a here and now issue. I mean, if there was ever a year to make everyone realize that sustainability is a clear and present danger, that we cannot wait. This is not an issue for your kids. This is not an issue for your, for your grandkids. This is a right now issue that is going to materially affect your employees, your clients, and your stock price. So focus on this now in a material way that involves the CEO, the CFO, the CRO, and really the whole C-suite. Well, thank you so much for a very interesting panel. Mary Shapiro, Lucrezia Reichling, and Audrey Troy. And have a great day, everyone. Thank you. This hugely important conference is focused on the risks and the opportunities of climate change, and in particular, the instrumental role that the financial system can play in supporting an orderly transition to a net zero carbon economy. Many in the financial system have already recognized that role. The encouragement and support of the conference today is testament uh, to that commitment. But as COP26, uh, private finance initiative has laid out so very clearly, we need to turn promises into practice and aspiration into action, starting now, not least since the eyes of the world will be upon us in Glasgow next year. As many of you know, this is easier said than done. The risks and the opportunities from climate change are unprecedented. They will affect the value of every real and every financial asset on this planet. And so to identify the risks and to seize those opportunities, we need to look forwards, not backwards. 
with a horizon of decades, not years, and without certainty about what will actually happen to our planet. That's not straightforward, but scenario analysis provides us with the toolkit for doing so. And so today I'd like to talk to you about the climate scenarios that were published in June by the Central Banks and Supervisors Network for Greening of the Financial System, and why those scenarios matter to you as financial institutions as well as to us in the NGFS. I hope that you will agree that there are critical input into the COP private finance initiative's ambition, both to transform climate risk management and to improve the quantity and the quality of climate-related disclosures. But let me first provide a bit of brief background on the NGFS and why it's chosen to develop these scenarios. The NGFS was set up in December 2017 with eight founder members, including the Bank of England, as a coalition of the willing designed to share best practice on the field of climate risk management and green finance. In less than three years, we've grown to over 70 central banks and supervisors, underlining the increasing importance of climate change to my community. And together, we represent a lot of intellectual firepower. Within the NGFS, I chair the macro financial work stream where our aim is to size the economic and financial risks from climate change. This slide shows how the physical and transition risks from climate change lead to economic and financial risks. It highlights that the channels from climate and financial risk are numerous with significant interdependencies. And as many of you will know from experience, the data and the methodologies to translate climate outcomes into macroeconomic and financial risks are incomplete and inadequate. Even the future path of the climate risks themselves is subject to huge uncertainty. As central banks and supervisors, we are clear that these uncertainties and complexities cannot lead to inertia and inaction. And that's why we have developed the NGFS reference scenarios to allow us all to explore economic and financial risks under a range of potential climate pathways. There are, of course, a myriad of possible climate pathways and so a myriad of climate scenarios out there. Which one should you choose? This slide sets out the NGFS scenario framework. The scenarios are organized on the horizontal axis by climate outcome. On the left, we assume the Paris goals are met and physical risks are contained. On the right, they're not met and physical risks are substantial. And the scenarios are also grouped on the vertical axis by the type of transition. In the bottom row, we begin to bend the carbon curve now and our transition is early and orderly. However, in the top row, our actions are delayed, so the transition is disorderly and transition risks are high. And what this highlights is that a simple two by two matrix does a pretty good job of exploring these different risks. The NGFS published in June its own reference scenarios in line with this framework. In addition to the macroeconomic and financial variables you usually associate with central banks, the scenarios include temperature pathways, the frequency and severity of weather events, emissions pathways, energy mix, and implied carbon prices. By using a range of different models and for the first time ever, our scenarios contain both transition risks and physical risks in a coherent way. They are therefore decision useful, reflecting the totality of the risks we might face. And unlike in all other scenarios, we have not assumed away huge swathes of risk in the design of the scenarios. Importantly, we've worked closely with a consortium that represents the best climate scientists in the field. And of course, we're bringing to the table our central bank macroeconomic and financial modeling expertise 
so that the scenarios further develop our shared understanding of these unprecedented changes. I should, though, note that modelling the economic and financial impacts is subject to significant uncertainty and extensive debate. So we need expertise and challenge from you too. I'll return to that later. Consistent with our two by two framework, the NGFS has produced three representative scenarios that are summarized in these two charts. Our three scenarios cover orderly, disorderly, and hothouse pathways. The orderly and disorderly scenarios both limit climate change, but in the disorderly scenario, the start of the transition is delayed from today to 2030. The left-hand chart shows emissions. Because of the delay in policy action, emissions reduction in this scenario have to be much steeper than in the orderly scenario. In the hothouse scenario, emissions continue to steadily increase and mean temperatures increase by more than three degrees. The economic impacts and the financial risks that this brings are significant. On the right hand side, we see what these emissions trajectories imply in terms of shadow emissions prices and so transition risks. What jumps out is that in a disorderly scenario, the emissions price increases sharply, reaching $700 per tonne of CO2 by 2050. As the blue line highlights, if we want to reduce these risks, we need to start now, not in another decade. At the Bank of England, like many other central banks and supervisors, we will use the NGFS scenarios for our own analysis. Specifically, the scenarios will serve as the basis for our upcoming climate stress test, the 2021 biennial exploratory scenario or BES. This exercise, due to launch uh, in the middle of next year, will cover three scenarios consistent with the NGFS scenarios and will explore both physical and transition risks. In addition to being our first stress test to include climate outcomes in not one but three scenarios and looking ahead decades rather than three to five years, the climate bears will also break ground in other ways. Both banks and insurers will participate in the stress test so that we can capture the interactions between them. The firms will be expected to conduct counterparty level analysis for their largest counterparties to capture the fact that this risk needs to be understood bottom up, asset by asset across the entire balance sheet, consistent with the economy wide risks that climate change brings. And we will look to identify common responses and feedback effects that have got the potential to increase the risks that we face. Through this exercise, we hope to deliver three things. First, to shine a light on risks that are currently opaque. Secondly, to highlight where the opportunities are to reduce those risks. And thirdly, to build capabilities and prompt customer engagement all of which will support COP private finance initiative aims. Let me finally turn to how these scenarios can be useful to you as well as to us and to outline our next steps. The scenarios are available for use now in a publicly available database. They can be used therefore in any financial firm's risk analysis. And they can be used by any of your real economy customers too. Indeed, these scenarios might be especially useful in supporting TCFD disclosure. We all know that for disclosures to be decision useful, they need to be forward looking, not static, and based on scenarios that are consistent and comparable. And the NGFS scenarios can be those reference scenarios. Let me end by noting that we have so far taken only the first step in our journey. I said at the start that our task was a complex one, 
creating climate scenarios for the financial sector is a difficult task and our scenarios will not be perfect. But since the time for action is now, we need progress today, not perfection later. Right now, we are doing further work to enrich these scenarios, adding more macroeconomic variables, providing greater geographical and sectoral detail, and adding more physical effects from climate change. We'll publish these new expanded scenarios early next year. To that end, we welcome comments from all of you on them. And we will report ahead of COP on how central banks have used the scenarios and the climate risk management lessons we have learned. In the meantime, can I encourage you all to use the scenarios too? By shining a light on the future risks and opportunities we face, these scenarios can help drive the action we need now. And if we all do that, we can make Glasgow proud. David Blood, Generation Investment Management. Uh, thank you for coming into Mansion House, and um, which is which is already a major a major <laughs> accomplishment uh, to physically be here. But um, you know, so, sort of more substantively, thank you for your leadership of the Portfolio Alignment Task Force uh, as part of the TCFD efforts. And we're going to spend uh, 20 minutes or so talking uh, about that. And I guess um, really the first question is. You know, just general, why is this important? What does it seek to accomplish? If you could just unpackage uh, this for Terrific. us. Well, the first thing I need to do is uh, thank the team. Uh, Irene, Levina, and the entire uh, team have done a tremendous amount of work. We hope that the document that we produced will be a tool to help financial institutions better assess their transition to net zero. Right. And the, the whole notion of what we want to talk about today is, is really the tools to, to help people think about that. Uh, I think there are, are four points that, that we need to, to establish. Uh, the first, very importantly, is uh, net zero will be the law of the land. And it's critical that asset managers, um, asset owners, banks, insurance companies recognize that and are aligning their portfolios to, to reflect that. So you could think of this as a risk management question, is how do you, or a compliance question, how do we ensure that we are um, aligned to net zero. But actually, I think the, the, the second reason is, is even more interesting, which is the transition to net zero will be the most significant transformation in economic history. And so from my perspective, what is really interesting about this is the capital allocation, the opportunities to allocate capital to this transition over the course of the next 5, 10, uh, 15 years. And so a CEO or a CIO absolutely needs to understand the compliance and the risk side of it. But really what's interesting is the capital allocation side of this. And I think with the United States uh, rejoining Paris, this will move very, very quickly. So the opportunities associated with the, net, the transition to net zero are, are real. But there are two other uh, reasons. The first is the, uh, the engagement opportunities. As investment managers, this, these types of tools will help us prioritize which organizations we're engaging with to transition them to, to net zero. Uh, and will give us uh, tools to, to sort of figure out where we, we are in, in that prioritization. But last but not least, and I know this is something that's very important uh, from your perspective as well, is ultimately this is a stakeholder management tool. Mm -hmm. We are going to have to talk to our stakeholders, our customers, our clients, our, our broader community as to how we're aligned to the transition uh, to net zero. Right. Okay, so there's a lot in that, and the tools can be used for many purposes. Maybe we'll start uh, from the institutional side, from the investor side, from the portfolio manage manager side, and just 
if we can go a bit more detail on um, some of the tools, you see you describe it as a tool both for risk management, but actually, you know, on, on the more exciting side, if you will, capital allocation, taking advantage of this opportunity. So give us a bit of a sense of the different ways, the different tools in the toolbox that can be used for portfolio alignment and how you would use them or do use them uh, when you think about capital allocation. Well, there, uh, you're right, there, there, is a, uh, there are an array of, of tools out there right now. And some actually are, are important, but they're static. And they, I would argue there are more risk-oriented tools, like what is the carbon intensity of your portfolio, of your loan book. And that's, inf that's important information. But as you begin to think about uh, the, the offensive side of this question or the engagement side of this question, it becomes important to, to understand what forward-looking metrics might be. And so what we've done in our report is developed uh, a, a continuum of sophistication. And, and that's a little bit grandiose in terms of a title, probably. But it gives you a sense that it basically goes on the notion that sometimes uh, the more uh, important differentiated insights that you can get as a fund manager or as a CEO or a risk manager are a bit more complicated and, and require a bit more information. And that's ultimately what we're, we're trying to show here. So in the, in the forward-looking metrics, and what we're looking for are metrics that are forward-looking, that are robust, that are based on science, and that we can action. Right. Ultimately. Right. And uh, so one question that one could ask or one portfolio metric is, well, what is uh, what percentage of your portfolio is already aligned with Paris? And you can get, just get a number and, and that's helpful information for sure. But that only kind of tells you sort of where you are as opposed to where you're going. And so a, a next step on this road of sophistication or continuum is, well, what if, if we look at uh, companies and then portfolios relative to a carbon benchmark. Right. And then, well, where are we on that? And that's definitely much more information. But can, I, can I just ask you a question on, on both of those items? So, and I'm going to play back something to you and you correct me. Um, when you think about um, what proportion is Paris aligned, um, it's, is it companies that have transition plans or some element that you know, they have an intention or they already are on the curve towards being Paris aligned? Is it that, as opposed to, say, an ESG rating or, or something in, uh, in, in that ilk? Well, it's a great question, and the answer is yes to all of those. Right. And that's okay. going to be one of the challenges we need to talk about as, as we go forward here, is that you, you don't actually know sometimes. It's, it could be one of uh, or all of those, those sorts of questions. Okay. Okay. And so that's why this continuum sophistication becomes more important, is that we're constantly looking for more commonality, more uniformity um, around the answers to those questions, and uh, which the benchmarking of, uh, of businesses and portfolios relative to a carbon budget is helpful in that regard. Right. But even that doesn't tell you okay, enough information. Okay, so, and I know you're going on this continuum of sophistication, but on the carbon budget, or what you said a moment ago, a kind of carbon benchmark, again, is that a sense of um, a trajectory of carbon reduction? Is it, does it vary by sector or country, depending on the portfolio you're managing? Or how, how just, again? Well, You've, you've actually hit the nail on the head. It's, it's a trajectory and it's all of the above. Okay. And, and that's important. It gives you important insights. But actually, it isn't enough because it's very variable. There isn't sort of a consistency. And so what right. might be one company, uh, maybe both companies have the same uh, benchmark or the same objective, but they're on different trajectories. And it's difficult to ass assess that. And so what we've been looking for, and uh, you, know, you and I have been on this journey for five years, is, is really to begin to say, well, all right, well, can we develop a, a more sophisticated uh, tool to give us a sense of well, really what, what, is, what is the carbon budget of this company? Where are they on the trajectory of Paris or transition to net zero? Right. Or where is a portfolio? relative to Paris or net zero. And that's the, the uh, warming metric that we're, we're talking about. Right. So can you just 
just describe the warming metric, uh, if, if, if you could, for people who haven't followed it as closely as, as you and I. Yes, and it's probably a blessing if you haven't followed it closely. <laughs> okay. But uh, so it comes in different uh, terms, ITR, implied temperature rise, right. or warming metric. But basically what it's trying to do is assess uh, a company or a portfolio on its journey to net zero. And it gives a, a basically a temperature score. And that's the beauty of it. It says, um, my portfolio, is, if, I, if I look at all the companies in my portfolio, and, and I, it's forward looking, and I'm yep. giving credit for the journey, but my portfolio would imply a 3.2 degree world. And there are some major institutions that do this at present? There are. In fact, the largest pension fund in the world, right. the Japanese pension fund, is doing it. And, and they, these tools have been uh, developed over the course of the last couple of years to try to make it clear to right. all stakeholders of where they are in the journey. The challenge is that the data that goes into that tool uh, needs a lot of work, and the assumptions that go into the tool vary. Right. And so you can have, and there are a number of different groups, all of which are doing really good work, but they are using different assumptions. And so you could actually have the same portfolio and run it through seven different organizations, and you'll get seven different temperature rises. Right. And, and the purpose of our report is to say, that's terrific, that's a good start, but we really need to harmonize and come up with, well, what we think is what, not we, but collectively the financial community think is best practice so that we can move towards uh, making these, uh, these tools uh, easier and better and more robust to use. Okay, well, let's, let's uh, I'm gonna hold that thought for a second, but just reemphasize it, which is that um, the sector as a whole coming up on this, as you say, a journey towards finding the right metric or metrics to show this dynamic, uh, the shift towards net zero. But uh, I think we all know that we've got a timetable for that journey, a timetable uh, to Glasgow. So we've got 12 months on that journey. And so I'll just ask those watching to you know, uh, remember that. Yes, exactly. Uh, and that part of the reason for the report is to uh, provide some framing for those discussions. But if I just Take us back before we go into some of the kind of early findings. Uh, but before that, um, let me just make sure again that we're all on the on the same page. Which is, uh, and I think maybe we need to acknowledge that net zero, which for those who are have been in the thick of this and the transition to net zero, is quite a familiar concept. But really, in mainstreaming sustainable finance, it's relatively new, right? Yes. And so uh, you've described along this continuum various ways to really classify the assets that you might have as an investment manager or, or an asset owner might have, classify them um, where they are on that journey and where they could get to, right? Is that, that's, that's the essence of that's the, exactly that's right. the essence, okay. And is one of the things, before I ask you about the key findings, is one of the things you're trying to test is how well these various metrics give credit or allow for judgment about a company that maybe was, had, hadn't taken this as seriously, let's, for whatever reason, but now was looking really um, to respond to the law of the land, to stakeholder uh, pressure and encouragement, and get on that road to net zero. And then the portfolio manager can maybe invest in something that has a pretty big carbon footprint, but intends to reduce it quite significantly. Is that? That is definitely part of it. Okay. That is definitely part of it. It's, it's really to provide full information to the capital allocator. The capital allocator may decide that, um, and in fact, we may want to encourage capital allocators to invest in the hard to abate sectors because that's how we'll get to net zero more quickly. It may also be that a capital allocator is uncomfortable with that and is, needs to wants to allocate to to yep. different sorts of, of assets. But it's the information that we're we're looking for. It's the tool to help us make those those capital allocation decisions. Okay, great. So um, you've looked at this. You've looked at um, these various ways, including um, some tools that are used for other purposes, like taxonomies, which yes. are used to define what is green as opposed to the transition to green, if you will. Um, so what are some of the early findings that uh, you've had that you're putting out for a consultation to help guide the... Well, there, there's sort of two buckets. Um, the, the bucket that I prefer to talk about are sort of the high-level buckets. Yeah. <laughs> and then there's some really... I, I prefer the high-level. <laughs> there are really yeah. some very important technical uh, conclusions. 
uh, which we clearly want to talk about yeah. uh, and certainly encourage folks to, uh, to read. But there are probably uh, five or six points that, that we're trying to make. The first is uh, th this is a journey. There are a number of, of metrices that we can be using and should be using. Some are better than others, but no one is perfect yet. And so uh, one approach might be to recognize that you probably need a couple of them when you're thinking about right. managing your risk or allocating uh, capital. The second is as much as uh, there, it, it's attractive to look for simple, the, the truth is we need more sophistication because the journey to net zero is a sophisticated challenge for the reasons we were talking about, the trajectory yep. uh, that, will, that, that is going on. The, uh, a third observation is the, the warming metric, while it has significant challenges, and it does have significant challenges. It has data challenges, it has methodology challenges, and we talk about that in the, in the report. It does have two really big advantages. One is it, it allows you to, to compare companies and portfolios in a way that you can recognize yep. in, a, in a more consistent way. And secondly, it's something that we can use to communicate more effectively. And this, this whole challenge of, of transition to net zero, the whole conversation around climate can get very complicated for those of us who've been living in it. Yeah. But we need, a, we need to br bring a lot of people with us in this journey. And implied temperature rise is something that people can, can get their arms around. And so it's, it's worth investing in some time and developing some tools to see if then if we can address the challenges because it is does have some terrific uh, strengths to it. Yeah, and I mean, and you said something earlier where you used the example of, uh, I guess, GPIF, the Japan Pension yeah. Fund, 1.6 trillion or dollars and counting, um, <laughs> exactly. uh, and, uh, and they're uh, and uh, they're north of three degrees. They they more or less not perfectly represent the market, but they're more or less yes. own the market. A little overweight Japan, but uh, more or less. Uh, the market, and you know that tells you something. Now, on the other hand, um, managing that portfolio towards one and a half degrees, which is their intention, which is Calper's intention, is that yes, right as well? Exactly. Um, AXA, Alliance, uh, Casta, you know, th that's their intention, man. And and so the judgment that either you as a portfolio manager or an institutional investor is making potentially with one of these metrics is to take a pool of assets and move them onto the road to Glasgow, if I use my analogy, or, or uh, aligned with Paris, and then they can be judged, and they have a tool, again, to track. That's, yes. that's what we're looking for. That, that's exactly right, and, yeah. it's, and it's both, again, it, it covers all of those four points. It's, it's a risk management tool that tells you, uh, from a risk yeah. management perspective, what your transition risk. It's a capital allocation decision, although very large organizations are, are the market, and that is somewhat more yep. challenging, but it's still important information. It's an engagement tool. And then importantly, our stakeholders, our, yeah. cons our customers, our, our clients, they're going to want to know that. Well, it's interesting. Uh, okay, so let me, uh, the two stakeholders, one, uh, it's, it's odd to talk about stakeholders, but through communities, governments, actually one thing it does do is it reflects back to governments. <clears throat> how much yes. progress still needs to be made. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but let's talk about the clients. It's, uh, you know, people watching. Um, ultimately, it's uh, everyone's savings uh, up and down the country, around the world. It's their money, whether it's in, you know, a, a big institution, a pension fund, a savings account, et cetera. And so how, how do you look at it uh, from a, from, you know, person on the street uh, perspective um, and a communication way, uh, what do you see as more attractive? What are some of the lessons? And what should the industry, what should the industry strive for, I guess, is the question. Well, I think that the industry has to strive for transparency. Mm. And, and, and we started the conversation with reminding um, our, our audience that this is a stakeholder conversation, and we're going to finish on that, but it, this really is a a hard-nosed capital allocation discussion as well, and, and, and therefore we have to do it from a purely capital allocation uh, perspective. But we also know that, our mul that there are multiple stakeholders that are going to increasingly be observing what the fin financial services industry is doing. And I would say, frankly, the financial service industry is lagging 
the real economy in right. responding to the transition to, to net zero. TCFD um, has it in their report that, that we in the financial services industry have a lot more work to do, and I th think that's true. And so this is an opportunity, frankly, to over the next 12 months to kind of get in front of the curve and be able to be uh, more more clear about what our what our portfolios our our investment strategies are are aligning to as it relates to the transition yeah. to net zero. Okay, that's a great point. Okay, we're we're coming towards the end. There's two critical points here, I think, um, and I'm going to come back to that last one. First is you very carefully say capital allocation uh, decision, but also another way to look at that is an opportunity to make. Um, to make alpha, I mean, outsized returns, because this issue of transition to net zero um, has not been mainstreamed. It hasn't been the way most you have been doing it, uh, other institutions, some other institutions, but most institutions haven't been looking at value from this perspective. All of a sudden, you're developing these tools, the industry is developing these tools to look at transition as a driver of value, right? Yes, yeah. exactly. Okay. Now, um, and the reason why that's such an important point is that I, think, I don't think we've really internalized how big of a deal this is. Right. This is truly a terrific economic capital allocation opportunity. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I totally agree. You know, society's decided here's where we're going to go. We're going to get to net zero. 126 countries in counting, and, and we are counting. Um, and uh, and uh, now the market's going to figure out how exactly. we get there, and exactly. that's going to unlock value. So, what happens? So, the last question. The next 12 months, where do we go from here? How do we how do we get consensus? Well, we hope the report will uh, be part of of a series of initiatives. Uh, TCFD is one of the initiatives. Uh, Net Zero Asset Owner uh, Alliance is another. The IIGCC is a yep. another <laughs> initiative, and we need we need to come together with all of these different groups and start talking about well, how do we harmonize this? So that, uh, and learn, by the way, for the next six months, there will be uh, more work done by the methodology providers. There'll be a number of uh, users of this, of, of this information and actually producers of this information, and we'll learn a lot over the next yeah. six months. But sometime this spring or summer, we're gonna have to come together and say, right, what have we learned? How do we try to drive to uh, as close to best practice as we can get as we go into to Glasgow? Because we really need this tool. We really need to be able to tell all of our stakeholders what, how our portfolios, how our companies are aligned to uh, the transition to net zero. Yeah. So it's really a, a quite an urgent initiative, it's frankly. It's an urgent, it's an important initiative. We've got the framework in order to get there. We've got the best in the industry now focused on it. We want everybody to focus on it. And there's tremendous momentum. And um, now you don't have to take it from me that there's tremendous momentum uh, because I think we've our time is up. Um, and we have uh, two last uh, speakers today, one of whom is the Chancellor of the Exchequer, um, who will give us all a sense of uh, what momentum looks like. Thanks, David. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me to speak at today's Green Horizons Summit. And I'm sorry we can't be together in person. And thank you to the City of London for hosting such an important event. Earlier this afternoon, I gave a statement to Parliament outlining our vision for the future of financial services in the UK. I believe this moment marks the start of a new chapter, a new role for the sector in supporting the economic recovery from coronavirus, a new relationship with the EU, and a new ambition to make the United Kingdom more open, more technologically advanced, and our focus today, a world leader in green finance. The challenge of climate change is clear, and it is urgent. We need to ensure a positive and fair transition to net zero and protect our environment. And we have an opportunity ahead with the UK's co-presidency with Italy of COP26 and our G7 presidency next year. We will provide leadership, working closely with governments around the world. But government cannot do this alone. The City of London is one of the world's preeminent financial centres with a long history of financing private sector innovation. And we're going to need your full weight 
all your expertise and capital to swing behind this critical global effort. This sector has already done a lot, and I'm pleased we're celebrating the progress already made over the next three days. But as we reshape our economies for net zero, we know we need to go further together. I'm announcing three new steps today. First, we're announcing the UK's intention to mandate climate disclosures by large companies and financial services firms across the economy by 2025, going further than recommended by the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, the first G20 country to do so. Second, we're implementing a new green taxonomy, robustly classifying what we mean by green to help firms and investors better understand the impact of their investments on the environment. And third, to meet growing investor demand for projects that can achieve environmental and climate goals in the UK, next year we will issue our first ever sovereign green bond, the first in a green curve of new issuances. These are important steps, all designed to enable the public and private sectors to work together with common purpose to deliver the transition to a net zero world. So thank you for everything you're doing on the road to COP26. Good luck with your discussions over the summit. And I look forward to hearing your thoughts and views about how we can go further together. Thank you. Well, what a day it has been. Over the past eight hours, we have heard from financial leaders on the crucial role of finan that finance will play in transitioning the global economy to a climate-resilient future. Most importantly, tangible actions and policies have been announced, which will pave the way to net zero. Just a moment ago, we heard from the Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, on the UK government's plans, from the introduction of a new green taxonomy to help firms and investors understand the impact of their decisions on the environment, to the very exciting announcement of the sovereign green bond in 2021, and of course, the plan to set the UK on a path to mandatory TCFD for all listed corporates and financial firms by 2025. In doing this, the UK will become the first G20 country to take this very important step. Earlier on in the day, we also heard from Mark Carney on his work to build a framework for the financial services industry, ensuring every financial decision takes climate change into account. Already much progress has been made in getting this framework off the ground with a focus set on the three R's and one M. Reporting, risk management, returns, and markets to mobilize. And if anyone can turn the M into a fourth R, we'd love to hear from you. On a serious note, I would strongly encourage you to read the private finance strategy for COP26 that Mark launched this morning, which you can find on the summit website. There are clear actions in here for all players across the financial services value chain. Supporting this, we heard from Christine Lagarde and the IMF, who backed the need for financial firms to provide more complete climate disclosures. And the Governor of the Bank of England, Andrew Bailey, announced the much-anticipated launch date of the climate stress tests for June 2021. The objective of these tests will be to predict the resilience of UK financial institutions over a 30-year period against three potential climate scenarios. We very much look forward to seeing the results of these tests later next year, and of course, to other regulators around the world taking similar steps. From the Buildings Panel, it was wonderful to hear from Rianne Marie Thomas, 
and Minister Kwarteng about how the practical realities of specific transactions are being worked through between financiers and governments. And it was great to see asset owners setting clear targets for the transition, with the United Nations Asset Owners Alliance setting out their approach to thermal coal, one of the biggest obstacles to our objective of one and a half degrees. Finally, we have heard from David Blood and the Portfolio Alignment Team, who published their new report on measuring portfolio alignment. This should be mandatory reading for all asset managers here in the city and around the world. Forward-facing metrics are critical if we are going to proactively allocate capital to those driving the transition and to send signals to those lagging behind. To say the least, it has been a busy day. The actions, policies, and reports announced are testament to the commitment of our sector to play its part in the green transition. Competitors have become allies. Proposals have become policies. And we are proving to the rest of the world the strength of the financial system when we work together. And the City of London is ready to lead the way. But this is only day one. There is much more work to be done. So without wanting to keep you any longer, may I say a huge thank you to all our speakers today and to all of you for joining us. I very much look forward to seeing you again bright and early at 9 a.m. GMT for day two of the Green Horizon Summit. Thank you.